Welcome to season four of your next mission video podcast. We have a great show for you today that focuses on service dogs. Colonel retired Dr. Gordon Sumner of Veterans Moving Forward joins us to talk about how service dogs are making an important impact in the lives of our veterans. He also tells us how service dogs aren't just changing lives, they're saving lives. You won't want to miss this one. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Welcome to Your Next Mission video podcast, where we tell the stories of those who have served in the past and those who are serving today. From transition to financial wellness, VA benefits to mental health, we cover issues facing veterans, active military, and their families. Now here's your host, the 12th Sergeant Major of the Army and co-founder of the American Freedom Foundation, Jack L. Tilly. Hello out there, warriors, past and present, your families, and thank you for your service to our great country. Now, before we get started, I personally want to thank our presenting sponsors, Navy Federal Credit Union, Purdue Global, and USAA for making your next mission happen. They love our veterans and families. I'm going to say it every single week. We love them, too. As I said earlier, we have a great show for you today, focusing on service dogs, and I'm, I'm excited to introduce Colonel Retired Dr. Gordon Sumner, President and CEO of Veterans Moving Forward. Welcome to the show. Sergeant Major, thank you so much. I'm so excited, so honored to be here. I've been looking forward to today for quite a while. Oh, I appreciate it. Well, I've been looking forward too because we had this great discussion. Hey, sir, before we get into the discussion, how about telling the audience just, you know, just a little bit about yourself? Well, as you alluded to, I am retired. I've uh, served in our great army for almost 28 years. And um, Started as a listed guy, I was part of the infantry, got a commission of infantry later on, served in various units like the Ranger Battalion, 82nd Airborne Division, 3rd Armored, 2nd Armored. In fact, I kind of laughed that every, I think every unit except the 82nd, maybe the Rangers that I've been in, they, uh, they're all folded and we're all in museum pieces now. So <laughs> I, guess it, I guess it was a good time for me to retire out. Yeah. But, uh, but I had an opportunity to, to serve afterwards and, um, had a chance to work for both uh, President Bush and Obama administrations and then stepped away from that and started my own consulting company about 13 years ago to help nonprofits. And that's how I got into what we're doing today. Wow. Well, well, you know, a lot of the same units that you just talked about, I, I'd served in. I was in the uh, 173 Airborne, of course, in Vietnam and 1st Armor, 1st Entry, 3rd Armor. I mean, I just in a, in a, of course, of course, I, I, I'm not going to say you quit, but you stayed 26, I stayed 36. So I guess maybe I was a slow learner or something. I don't know. I just kept hanging on there a little bit. <laughs> hey, sir, how about, uh, tell, us, uh, tell us about how uh, veterans moving forward, uh, how you got to, you know, really working with service dogs. Well, it happened to be just, I don't want to say a fluke, because as I told you when you and I had our conversation a couple of weeks ago, I literally believe I'm the poster child for God works in strange and mysterious ways. Uh, even if you look at my military career and some of the things that I was able to do and places I served and the people I met, I just don't believe that that many uh, occurrences happen by chance. And the same thing happened with veterans moving forward And that when I left the Obama administration and I started my own service disabled veteran owned very, very, very small business because it's just me <laughs> and Native American small business. And what I wanted to do was at first I thought uh, to help veteran businesses, but you know, at the end of the day, I just wasn't happy. I, I was making money, but the happiness factor wasn't there. And it's not about money, it's about satisfaction. And so I thought, so I had a kind of come to Jesus meeting with myself over the weekend and my wife kind of prodded and said, well, what is it that you really like doing? What makes you happy? And I said, serving, serving people. That's what I've done my whole life. And that's when the light came on to start working with organizations that are uh, nonprofits that are that are working with veterans. Exact same time I had that epiphany, I got a phone call from the two co-founders, retired Navy Commander Karen Jeffries and her friend Bob Larson. And they had this idea of starting Veterans Moving Forward to provide service dogs to veterans that are dealing with physical or mental challenges at absolutely no cost to the veteran. And what makes VMF unique is that when we started it, it was there's no caveats. There were organizations out there and still are to this day that provide service dogs to veterans, but you had to meet a certain niche. So 
you had to be a Marine to get a dog from this group, or you had to have been wounded in combat, or you had to only be a 9-11 or Afghan Iraq veteran to get a dog. If you're a Vietnam veteran, some of us older guys, um, you couldn't get a dog from, from an organization like that. Oh, wow. Ours, yeah. Our requirements are real simple. You had to serve honorably, which we note off your DD-214, and that you have documentation from your primary care provider. And if you're under mental health, it's your mental health primary care provider that they document in writing to us that they, too, support your efforts to get a service dog. That's it. You don't have to only be in Virginia. You can be nationwide. So what I did was I thought when I got the phone call that this would be a great business opportunity. But I got to be honest with you, my friend. I fell in love with what they were doing. There I was back serving veterans in a special category that I hadn't done before, providing service dogs and watching that transformation with these veterans when they get their service dogs. So much to the chagrins of my bride, Miss Vicki, uh, I told her I wasn't doing it as a consulting job. I was going to do it for free as a volunteer. <laughs> yeah. So uh, so she said, okay, I trust you. And uh, I've been with the organization from the beginning, uh, now 12 and a half years ago. I stepped away when I became the Purple Heart Commander for the Northern Virginia Chapter 353 of MOPH. And then in 2019, the board asked me if I'd come back uh, out of retirement and serve full time as president. So I've been back now almost four years. Yeah. yeah you know, one of, the, one of the things you hit on a, uh, a few minutes ago, you talk about Vietnam veterans. You know, a lot of veterans uh, come out of war and they may not have uh, physical ailments that you can see, but, uh -huh. they, have, but they have scars. Everybody mm -hmm. that goes to war and comes back has scars. And so uh, what you're doing is incredible. The other thing I tell you is that uh, when I came back out of, I, I'll never forget, when I came out of Vietnam, uh, there wasn't uh, there wasn't anything for Vietnam veterans. I mean, you mm -hmm. come in, most of them stayed two years and got out of the service. And uh, I, I often, well, I know it's true, a lot of them went and lived on the streets because they mm -hmm. just never fit in again. And so, you know, what you're doing is just incredible because I, I know it helps, there's no question. I'm sure that the dogs you you uh, use to train have a special disposition. Uh, mm -hmm. Where where do they come from? Where do you get the dogs anyway? We have a really good relationship with about three or four breeders here in Northern Virginia and West Virginia that are very specific in their training and their their breeding, uh, how they take care of these dogs. And so over the years, our head trainer and program director, Katie Paulson, with her many, many years of experience in this field, she has great relationships with these breeders. We we often get the pick of the litter. I mean, they will literally call her up and say, hey, got a litter coming up in a couple of months. Do you have room for another puppy? And if we have a puppy raiser and a home for that puppy to go to while we're training it, then we'll take that dog and um, they, they, uh, they get trained and, and we graduate them. Hmm. Is there any dog better than the other? I mean, is there, there's one, I mean, <laughs> uh, what I well, mean is there, is we, there like a, I, I got a Chihuahua and a Shih Tzu. I mean, what's the best dog to have for? Well, I don't know. I won't say that there's a best dog because it depends upon what you're after for us. And what we have seen over the recent years that our veterans need both for physical assistance, as well as mental assistance, our, uh, Labrador retrievers that we get from these breeders have worked out the best. And over the years, we trained all kinds of dogs, German Shepherds, Standard Poodles, uh, Golden Retrievers. I mean, we, we trained them all. So um, I was just looking. I, I don't know if you could see him real quick, but there's one of our dogs that I've got living with me right now. That's Vincent. <laughs> um, hey, Vincent. He's looking like Vincent taking a nap. <laughs> yeah, he is. He's bored to tears with me. I, I've been working him pretty hard today, so he's taking a dog break. But so all of our and all of our dogs are named after veterans that were killed in combat. Yeah. Uh, so it's a great way to honor them and remember them. Yeah. Yeah. You know, going back to my dog, my, dogs are smart, incredibly smart. I remember uh, we we've had a, a series of dogs over the years, but this little Shih Tzu well, is a little baby uh, puppy, and I, I don't know if he had it a couple of weeks or whatever. And, and the <laughs> dog's sitting by the front door, and says, "Geez, okay, well, I'll take the dog out to go to the bathroom." So the dog literally trained itself. <laughs> when you go to the bathroom, you go to the front door. The other thing this dog does is that uh, our dog won't, it won't go outside without a leash and it won't go in our garage. It'll stop right at there or just sit there. And, and I, huh. I, I don't know why, but I mean, I love it because he doesn't, or she doesn't run around or anything. I, I think you said it already. Why don't I ask you the same question again? How, what did the dogs cost anything? I mean, what do you pay for them oh, yeah. and, and what do they cost for the veteran, I guess? Yeah, well, 
the the dogs run around three to four thousand dollars a puppy. Yeah, uh, and that's and that's getting it on a um, discounted rate from the from the breeders. Sometimes we do get them donated, uh, or we have sponsorships that an organization will help defray some of those initial costs. But that's the that's the price tag now for a, for a pu- eight week old puppy. By the time we get done training for the two years, they run between forty to fifty thousand dollars all total expenses. Yeah, yeah. And it's not a. This is not a cheap nonprofit. <laughs> yeah, well, that's. But but uh, it's it's money well spent. Uh, well, yeah. yeah, there's no question. Absolutely, about it. absolutely. Yeah. In, in fact, I'm very proud of what we've done over the last four years. If you go to GuideStar or uh, whatever it's called now, Candid. Um, our charity navigator, you'll see for the last four years, we've rated the very top ratings that you can get platinum rating with the uh, guide star and the four stars with charity navigator. Yeah. And that's because 80 cents of every dollar that's donated goes directly to the, to the puppies. The yeah. other 20 cents goes to admin and fundraising. Yeah. Yeah. I, I know you've already talked about it a little bit already, but how you rename your dogs, you know, your name, your dogs, how did you, who come up with that idea? Well, it was kind of a idea about we want names, but how do we do this? And I don't know who came up with. I might have said it. it this is. Well, why don't you I take it? It's your. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Just you take the honor for it. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> uh, I know. I can't remember what I had for dinner, let alone what I did twelve years ago. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, we came up with this idea of how can we honor veterans especially those who gave their their lives for our country. And so it was just a natural fit to name these dogs after those veterans of all services. So it started off with Afghan and Iraq because that's where we were at the time, you know, still fighting that and still losing our, our military. And then um, we, we had a discussion about, well, we need to look at other uh, periods of history in our, in our nation. And it just so happened that that weekend, they had an article or news um, story on the local Channel 7 News about Corporal Frank Buckles, who was the last World War I combat veteran who had just passed away when this story popped. And so they had a thing about Corporal Buckles. So guess who the next dog's name was? Corporal Buckles. Buckles. <laughs> yep. So Buckles came in. So that was uh, my wife looked at me and said, there's your dog's name. And I said, yeah, how do you say no to a Buckles? And. And so he, uh, so that's, so that's how it happened. And then we just transitioned World War II, Korea. Um, we do have a dog that's being, uh, we've had Baldy, which was back to Afghan. Uh, he graduated in January and on 4 June, Jacob, uh, graduates with his battle buddy. And Jacob is also a, uh, uh, Iraq veteran, uh, Marine Sergeant Jacob Beisel, who was killed in Fallujah. And so uh, his his memory uh, is is going to be graduating through uh, service dog Jacob this coming uh, for June. Yeah, well, you know, you maybe think of a couple of things. One is you should say Corporal Buckles. You should put maybe, maybe the second thing is uh, well, how can you know the identif- tag, identification tag that you have on the dog that uh, is it made out of a dog tag? I, I was thinking that I said that'd be pretty neat if it was. Yeah, no, the, the vests are just the standard vests, and then we put the patches, you know, like our, our patch on yeah. on the side. Yeah. Each of the dogs have a little zipper, so they have their papers that ah. shows where they were trained, yeah. and they also have cards. So, for example, uh, here is service dog Ashley. Yeah. Ashley is named after Army First Lieutenant Ashley White, who was killed in Afghanistan in 2011. She was the first female who served with a army special forces operations group because she felt it was important to have females in the units out in the field talking to the tribes to bring that female bridge connection oh my god and and unfortunately an ied um detonated and killed her and her two soldiers as they were returning from a mission but every dog has their card so you can see where it has who we are yeah, a little bimbo yeah, yeah. and then on the inside it tells who the dog is and who they're named in honor of and then the dog information and our contact so every yeah. dog has that in their pouch as well yeah that's pretty cool i, I gotta tell you one fun funny story i had a uh, god i can't think of his name right now but i had a friend of mine that was stationed in hawaii and i went to hawaii and to visit and stuff and he says you know i got an incredible dog here and, you know i said yeah yeah okay he said no no this is <laughs> the smartest dog i ever met i ever had 
I said, well, why is it so smart? And he did. He says, okay, watch this. He brought the dog over there. He said, uh, Air Force chow. Dog wouldn't open his mouth up. <laughs> he said, he said, Navy chow. Dog wouldn't open his mouth up. Coast Guard chow. Dog wouldn't open his mouth up. Army chow. Dog. Get <laughs> the food in there. <laughs> That's hilarious. It is later. The good dog over there, that's for sure. Hey, sure, this is a great discussion. Please hold that thought. I got to do a little commercial work here real quick. Here. Okay. We're talking with Colonel Retired Dr. Gordon Sumner, President and CEO from Veterans Moving Forward. And, you, and you're watching your next mission video podcast with me, your host, Jack L. Tilly, 12th Sergeant Major Army. And don't forget, if you're enjoying this discussion, please like us. Click on that subscribe button below. Please also, please also click on the bell next to the subscribe button to receive notifications of all those upcoming video podcast releases. Sir, I, I'm sure you have story after story after story behind the service dog and the impact they're having on, on quite a remarkable you know group of people. Can you just share a story with us, maybe one of your best stories or, or a couple of stories if you want? Well, my favorite is the one that I shared with you and Ted a couple of weeks ago. And this is where we had an older gentleman, guy my, about my age, uh, coming to, to, to connect with us to see about a service dog. And how that happened was he lives in Williamsburg, and he happened to be friends with a fellow Purple Heart member, the commander of the Williamsburg Purple Heart uh, military or the Purple Heart chapter, who convinced him to come up and see us about because he too felt that he needed could use a service dog. This individual had been uh, a Graves registration guy had seen a lot of stuff. In fact, Doc had tried to commit suicide three times oh, before, he, before he came to us. Yeah. So we finally got him to come up. And as I told you, our training facility has two two doors, glass doors. So we, Katie and I could see this car go back and forth in the parking lot, kind of hesitant to pull in. Finally, he did. He gets out of the car. After a while, he didn't just immediately open the door. He walks in, he's got a cane, he's humped over. He just looks like sad sack personified. Everything had gone wrong. He, he was just down in every venue that you could think of. We got him hooked up with Zamp, who's named after uh, Louis Zamperini, Marine legend. And eight months later, they walk out the door together. Battle buddies. He now shows up at the training center, and I thank God that he keeps his car in great shape because he comes flying up to the parking lot, wheels in, hits the brakes, doors fly open. He and the dog jump out. <laughs> they come into the training center, um, no cane, no nothing. Wow. And, and he tells me the story as he's sitting there. He says, hey, I just want you to know that uh, I had a hell of a year. I had major surgeries. And then he shows me a picture of Zamp laying in the hospital bed with him while he's recovering. To let the hospital let Zamp not only stay in the room, but actually stay in the bed with him. I lost my father over the holidays. It was really bad. He says, but you know what? Not one time did I even think of suicide. And the reason is, is because I've got Zamp with me. Yeah, my goodness. And I have purpose. I have a purpose in life because I've got my battle buddy Zamp. It's wonderful. He, he's, he's, everybody that knows me uh, has recommended Butchers moving forward to me about a year ago. And I made the application and went through the process. And uh, it's just going to open all kinds of doors for him. Yeah, my goodness. You know, I, I, I wonder, as, you, as you're talking to me, think, why, why, why don't, I guess, why don't the military services have a... Uh, a service dog program that they give a veteran before he gets out of the military. I mean, I don't think that's possible or maybe, maybe we do something like that now. I don't know. Well, no, we don't. In fact, the department of VA has no service dog program either. If you need a seeing eye dog, you can go talk to them and they'll give you some funds to go get one. But if you need a service dog or emotional support dog, like what we provide, like Vince over here, um, the VA says, we can't do that, but but in the meantime, we'll give you 20, 25 pills and take those and call us in the morning. We've actually had veterans come through our training that have been on more than two dozen meds at one time. And wow. after they get their service dog, they literally go down to maybe one or two medications, usually a sleep aid or something like that. All the rest of those meds get trashed. I've actually gone down Another story, uh, we had a sergeant down in Fredericksburg 
who had uh, who had a dog. Went down just to do a house visit, check, see how he's doing and how's the dog's doing. And I walked in, he said, hey, sir, I got something for you. Can you wait a minute? And he went in the back of the house and came out and he said, here, sir, would you take this and get rid of it for me? And Sergeant Major, it was a Ziploc, a quart size Ziploc bag full of pills out of the box, out of the containers, just the pills themselves. He says, I don't need these anymore. And so I took them and we disposed of them. But that's that's the value that's that's the stories that's the history of what these service dogs are doing for these veterans every day of the year you, you know I, I, again just listen to your talk I, you ought to you ought to approach have you ever approached the va or maybe dod and says hey look i think these service dogs ought to be because i really I, I mean in the long run what you just said especially about the amount of pills but also <clears throat> bottom line on everything is how do you save money and if you know somebody had a service dog and maybe even the just what you talked about the lives that you uh, save with these dogs. I think that's a great idea. Uh, well, I, I initially back in 2012, I wrote a white paper to give to the uh, Department of VA on the value of service dogs and service dog programs for yeah, our veterans. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was like, okay, noted. Thank you very much. Now, I will say that last year, President Biden signed into law the PAWS Act, Puppies Assisting Veterans uh, Services or something like that. Sounds like the VA started looking at service dogs for veterans. The The act itself, though, doesn't provide service dogs. All the VA is going to do for the next five years, five years, they're talking to 10 different nonprofits. Unfortunately, we're not one of them that's located across the country that provide service dogs to do an analysis for five years to see if this is really a good program. Think of Think of the veterans, think of the number of veterans, if we're still in somewhere between that 18 to 22 veterans a day that are committing suicide, do the math. How many veterans are we apt to lose because we can't get them something that I know will save their life and it's laying right here because the VA is going to do a five-year study to see if it's worthwhile. It doesn't make sense. You know, I had, uh, I don't know if you ever knew General Kukulo. He was, uh, I was with him when he was, uh, a lieutenant colonel, anyway, he got to be the public affairs for the United States Army. And he says something that just resonated with me. I'll probably never forget it. He says, uh, somebody comes up with a good idea and we talk about it, 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 talk about it. And then it's outdated normally. But I think this is a way, if you ever get a chance, send me a copy of your white paper. I'd love to just look at it. And uh, I don't know if I could ever help, but I. I'm going to mention that when I get a chance at different uh, different areas because I think that uh, certainly helps. I'd like to jump into training just a little bit. How long or how old do uh, you know our dogs when they you know really enter the program? Are they babies or they're two three years old or yeah. how old are they? No, we get the dogs at eight weeks, and so what happens at around four weeks is when our head trainer Katie that I mentioned earlier goes mm -hmm. out to start to look at the litter and goes through some exercises with these cuties. So that four or five weeks later, she's again doing more evaluations this time, and it kind of narrows it down to one or two dogs, and then she she picks one, um, and then she brings brings the dog home, uh, well to us to the training center, and then it's it's a two year program. So the, all the dogs go through the base what I call basic training. You know, when we were talking the other day, I, I talked about how we do basic training at AIT. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, the dog, so the dogs go through a, a year plus of basic training, and that's where they do all their AKC, canine good citizenship training, all the standard uh, commands, uh, everything that just you want a, a dog that you could take outside and not worry about the dog doing something. So that takes about a, a year plus with some advanced things in there. Then we start going into the first phase of AIT, where they start to learn more advanced skills, such as turning lights on and off, opening doors, closing, uh, opening refrigerators, closing the door, fetching things, um, and then getting in and out of various vehicles. We take them to the airport there at National, as well as Dulles, so they can get used to not just the terminal, but they go behind the scenes, so they actually get into the gateways, they go down the jetways, they get into different models of aircraft, and so one bulkhead looks a little different in this one, so they know where they're pretty much going to sit when that veteran wants to go fly, so that we joke about the veteran now feels really good about getting outside and getting out and traveling with their family, and the old joke is, so what are you going to do, soldier? Well, I'm going to go to Disney World. Yeah. Well, 
we don't want the dog going onto the aircraft for the first time with that veteran who's going onto the aircraft, but may be the first time. So the dogs are trained in those kind of skill sets. Then around that 18 month mark, as these veterans are being vetted through their program side over here, we look to see what the talents and attributes of these dogs are at that 18 month mark. And then we try to identify what are some of the mechanisms that this veteran needs support with and what are their triggering mechanisms. So you could have a veteran, as you said at the very beginning, there are invisible wounds. And so what happens when a, when a veteran who looks okay on the outside but can't stand to be in a crowd or can't uh, sleep at night or has anxiety attack just by walking out the door to, to get mail? Yeah. Or like one of our veterans, he couldn't get outside and walk his daughters down their long driveway to the bus stop, which was at the end of the driveway. He would literally put them in the car, drive the car down, and they would sit in the car until the bus drove up. They would then get out, get on the bus, and then he'd drive the car back. Now, I got a picture that his wife took, shows him and his two daughters and the dog by his side. They're walking down the driveway in the morning to go, go catch the bus. Yeah, yeah. So we start. So we start to then train the dog on those key things, such as turning lights on, fetching medicines. I tell people we actually teach the dogs to fetch water bottles out of a refrigerator. The nice thing about it, unlike kids, the dogs are taught to close the refrigerator door. So, uh, so that makes so that makes it very, very useful. What about beer? Will it get a beer? No. I... Yep. Yep. They know the di- <laughs> nope. They know the difference in oh, a really? bottle beer and a can beer. Oh yeah. So you can tell them to go get a Heineken, or you can tell them to go get a Bud. And the dog, we can train them to know the Heineken's in glass and the Bud's in the can, and they'll bring whichever one you want. Okay. Absolutely. This would be absolutely perfect if we could teach the dog to cook. Can you, can you teach the dog? Well, I, you know, we laugh, but Vincent here. Oh, no. His, his, nick, no, his nickname in the house is the rug, okay? <laughs> and the reason is he looks like a big Afghan rug to start with. Yeah. But I have a, my kitchen upstairs is, is not... It's not very big. I mean, it's yeah. a typical Northern Virginia house. And i that's my oasis. I come home and I just turn me loose in the kitchen. I got a glass of wine and yeah. I'm just fixing dinner. And Miss Vicky's nice. She'll eat anything. And, but I do have speed uh, Pizza Hut on speed dial just in case. <laughs> but what Vincent does is he lays right in the middle of the floor. And I have to literally walk around him like this to go from the cutting table to yeah. the stove to the sink. So I told him the other day that funny you should mention that. I said, you know, if if I could just teach you how to be a sous chef, you could really earn your keep here while I'm training you. Yeah. But right now you're just a rug, <laughs> cute rug, but a rug. Hey, I, you know, I, 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 when, I, I think you said it, but let me ask. You, I think you said 18 months. About the 18 month mark is when you put the veteran and the dog together. Is that right. it? Correctly? Is it, yeah. and it could be a little quicker, a little longer, I guess. Uh, but right. then the yeah. two year part. Yeah. Yeah, and it and we do it in stages. I mean, it's just the first thing is we want to introduce the veteran to the dog. So that's like the day that Doc came. Remember, I was telling you about he finally got out of the car and came in. We mm-hmm. had Zamp there to meet him. All that was was about an hour, hour and a half of them just meeting, meeting us, meeting the dog, the dog laying at his feet because we want to see if the dog likes the veteran. It doesn't happen all the time, but there's a point one percent. That sometimes the, you know, Jack Telly walks in and, you know, the rug here looks at you and goes, uh-uh. no, nope, <laughs> not going to work yeah. and walks off. So now we're back to, to the drawing board. Yeah. But it's very rare that happens. But, yeah, we just do it. Then a little bit more, maybe in an afternoon of training. And then maybe a, they take the dog with them and stay at the hotel with them that night, or the weekend, a week until – Right towards the end of their training period, around that two-year mark, that's where they have what I call the crucible, so that the veteran and the dog are together two to three weeks every day, night, and they they finish it up, and then we graduate them. Yeah, you know, it's really funny. I was gonna I was gonna ask you that same question. You know, uh, having a dog's like being married. You know, every, all the marriages don't last, so you got to make sure you link the right person up. I, you know, I have a two-part question here. Uh, I wonder. Th- Families get involved in the process, and uh, and how do service dogs impact the you know whole family and the community, or, or, or do they impact yeah. the whole family and community? Well, they do, and um, that's why we always say it's a it's a three-legged support 
it's not just the veteran. The, the veteran's family gets a lot of support. Yeah. The kids, the wife, spouse, um, they also get the love because the dog's going to love everybody. And then the community gets supported because now that veteran is not staying at home. They're not living in the basement somewhere. They're now getting back out in society. So they're doing what? They're going back to church, their synagogue, their, their temple, wherever. They are uh, going back to school. They're getting jobs. So they're now getting back out. I mean, they're getting groceries. They're buying gas. They're paying taxes. That's what we retirees like is that they're paying taxes because that's where we get our retiree check. So I kind of like that idea. So that gets them out in the community. We have a veteran, uh, Ashley veteran, is a Marine in Montana. He couldn't go to his kids' athletic games. He couldn't sit in the stands and watch his son play football. He couldn't sit in the bleachers and watch his daughter play soccer. Guess what he does now? He hasn't missed a game since he's had Ashley well, as of last November. Yeah, yeah. Oh, my goodness. So we, and we get pictures. So – that's how all that, that works out is that they do it. And how that happens is that once we know that the veteran and the dog are, that are connected, then we also start to introduce the family member. For example, Doc, he brought his wife up, and she got a chance to spend some time there in the training center with, with Zan, who, by the way, she was deathly afraid of dogs. Now she just loves him, and he loves her. In fact, he checks on her. After he knows Doc's okay in the morning, he's got his coffee and his paper and he's watching TV, he goes back upstairs and checks on the wife until she wakes up and then they come back down together. Yeah. So, so he has them both. So that's how that happens. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I know that's, uh, you know, as, again, as you're, you're talking, I'm, I'm always thinking about stuff. You know, we, we've had a lot of, uh, of veterans that get out of the military. In fact, I had one my brother told me about not too long ago that, uh, Actually got out of the service, went home, and and just and, and he asked me to get him into service. So I got him into service. Uh, he went in during Iraq and Afghanistan, spent his three or four years, got out of the service. And uh, the other time, a couple, a month or so ago, when I was out, my brother, I asked him, I says, "How's uh, how's he doing?" He says, "Not very good." I said, "What do you mean?" He said, "He just got out of the military, went home, and just sitting in one spot, not moving." Mm -hmm. And I think we have a lot of veterans that that do the same thing because they're struggling that they really don't know. Uh, you know, how to reach out sometimes, how to get help or how to get assistance. So, sir, this is a great discussion. Don't you go anywhere. We've got to take another commercial break. Don't you go anywhere. We'll be right back. You're watching your Next Mission video podcast. You're watching your Next Mission video podcast, proudly presented by Navy Federal Credit Union, the most trusted credit union owned by members of the military community, serving all branches of the armed forces and their families. Their members are the mission. Learn more at NavyFederal.org. Purdue Global, you're ready for a comeback, and with Purdue Global, you can do more than take classes, you can take charge of your story, of your career, of your life. Earn a degree you can be proud of and get an education employer's respect. Start your comeback at PurdueGlobal.edu. USAA. A promise is a trust not to be broken. Whether spoken with an oath or sealed with a pinky. And after 100 years, we're still taking care of the military community and their families. That's our mission, always. Now back to your host, the 12th Sergeant Major of the Army, Jack L. Tilly. Welcome back. We're blessed to be here today with Colonel Retired Dr. Gordon Sumner, President and CEO of Veterans Moving Forward. And I want all of our viewers to reach out to me directly. Tell us about your transition. Tell us what topics you like as a government. I, always, I, always, I want you to know <laughs> this is not my show. This is our show. So tell us what topics you'd like us to put on the show. You can call or text me at 844-424-1134, and I'll actually reach back out to you. Or send me an email at... Uh, SMA Tilly at yournextmission.org. Sir, unfortunately, we're heading into our final segment with you, and I hope you've enjoyed it just as much as I have. I just, mm -hmm. just have a couple more questions. And uh, Are there any qualifications for a veteran to have a service dog? I mean, what are the qualifications to have a service dog? Well, as I mentioned earlier, served honorably, and that you've got documentation from your primary care providers that say they support you, and that's it. You, you've apply by going to our website that we'll talk about in a minute i'm sure and fill out the form right there on the website you hit the send button it goes straight to our head trainer and program director 
And that starts the process to get you into the system, start to get your paperwork, because there's some more paperwork involved. And we do a very thorough investigation of the veteran, because this is like you're now going to be a a parent. So we're about to give you this live being that you now become responsible for. So we don't just take this for granted that you're going to be able to just do it just because you say you can. So we we do home visits, which is another way that we get the families involved. We actually do training for a minimum of at least a week, about halfway through that six months window where our trainer with the dog goes and visits the family on site and does the training there within the community. So there's a lot of things that, that go on and that's how it happens. Yeah. Hey, so there's, since the beginning of venture moving forward, how many dogs have you put into service and, and how many individual families uh, have you helped? You know, I'm sure it's a, a number is probably quite big. Or... Well, it's because we have another program besides just the, the service dog. We have what we call a facility dog. Now, a facility dog is basically a, a um, service dog level train. All the skills and attributes and tasks and everything, that's what they do. Their challenge is they have a hard time focusing on one individual. They, these dogs still are very gregarious and they love everybody. So what we do is we provide that dog with a veteran who can still use a service dog, but we find them where they work in mental health clinics or VA hospitals or somewhere like that so they can take the dog to work and then that dog has access to all of these veterans and some first responders, which, as you and I know, are mm-hmm. a lot of veterans from the Guard and Reserve. That's their job is being a first responder. So they have a chance to touch these individuals when they come in for their mental health um, treatments. So, for example, Gil, who's down in Virginia Beach at um, Tactical Recovery, he goes with his uh, veteran team and works there during the day. And since he's been there, December a year ago, he's had what we call a touch. So that's where he's physically in the room during group training or with an individual in private training or treatment that he's touched over 4,500 individuals in the last year and a half. Oh my goodness. Yeah. And so in that plus we've had well, well over 30 dogs nationwide over the years. In fact, we've actually now into that cycle where a veteran has uh, a dog that has now aged out or passed away because of the age of you know, that time. So we've actually given a veteran a dog, a second dog, and we're working right now to give another veteran, Air Force veteran, she's getting her second dog here in about another month. Mm-hmm. How, how can a veteran apply to get a service dog? Is there a, uh, here you just, go, your website and phone number, I guess yep. right now, okay. Yep, just go to our website at www.vetsfwd.org. So it's V-E-T-S, fwd.org vetsforward.org scroll across says apply you click on that there's the the, uh, page you type it in hit the send button and you're in the system you'll be contacted uh, really soon okay is there a phone number too sir is there a number phone number you want to add or yep there's a phone number that you can you can also call the office if you have any questions and that number is 703 excuse me 703 um, I have, I never call myself, so I have to look 703-665-2129. That's the office. And there also, you can do admin at vetsforward.org as well. V E T S F W D email. And it'll again, go straight to the, uh, to the volunteer groups that does a lot of the coordinating with the veterans and the dogs for us. How, how can somebody help you? If somebody wants to help uh, your organization, what's the, well, uh, what can I help you? I guess what kind of help do you need? Yeah. <laughs> well, obviously as a nonprofit, we, we live off of donations. There's no federal state um, government dollars that come to us. As we talked earlier, there are no VA dollars. There's no federal government money that comes to organizations like us. We live on individual donations corporate donations, foundations, and just uh, the kindness of Americans who say they not only support our veterans, but they show it by making these donations. Again, our dogs run forty to $50,000 a dog, and I've got over 50 veterans on a wait list right now. So I've got to get more money, train more dogs to help more veterans, their families, and their communities. So how can you help? You go to our website, and it says donate. You can do a one time or we encourage people to become a monthly sustaining donor. And if you have any questions, please just reach out to me at uh, at admin.vetsfwd. It'll tell you, you want to talk to Dr. Sumner and they'll get it right to me. Okay. So I, first of all, let me say I appreciate all that you're doing for our, our veteran community and all you continue to do. And, and it's really 
you know, I, I used to tell everybody, you can take me out of the army, take the uniform off, but you can't take me out of the army. I'll always be a soldier till the day I die, just like you. Any final thoughts, yeah. anything that you want to share with the audience that maybe we missed or that you want to add? Well, you hit it right on the right on the uh, head on the nail there, Sergeant Major. When you, and as I tell people, yes, I retired, but I'm still a commissioned officer. My commission is just in retired status, mm -hmm. which that means that I just hung up my uniform, but it didn't mean that I stopped caring about our military and their families. Yeah. I'll do that until I'm lowered in the, into the grave. So how can you, again, help? If you got an idea, contact me. Let's talk. Um, one other idea that a lot of people are doing, companies are doing uh, client appreciations. And it may be a, a dinner, or maybe just a wine tasting, or maybe just, hey, come out and let, let us just tell you how much we appreciate you. Some of those are now turning those into fundraisers. So they bring their clients in and say, thank you for business for the last year. Also, we're doing a fundraising for a great nonprofit veterans moving forward. Bring your checkbook because we've got a goal of raising $10,000 or whatever during this event. And you know what? It's working. People are coming. They're thanking their customers, especially through COVID, staying with them and fundraising. And they're getting a twofer. It's helping us out. It's making their customers and clients. And it's also spreading the word with others who then take that back about, huh, that sounds like a good nonprofit. Maybe our company should look into that as well. So yeah. that's another means that you could do that that you could help us. Yeah, sir. Well, uh, again, uh, thank you so much for what you're doing. I appreciate you coming on the show. And and uh, if I can ever help you, please let me know. Sergeant Major, you know, uh, seeing an old friend like this and being with you, I, as I said, I was excited when uh, you and Ted contacted me and saying you wanted me to be on your show. I've been watching it all these uh, months and years. And, and now that I'm on, I, um, I can't say thank you enough for allowing me to talk to your audience about veterans moving forward because, as I've said before, we're not just changing lives, we're saving lives because we're providing these deserving veterans with that new leash on life. Oh, absolutely. Well, I got one more thing for you. Get all those dogs to be subscribers to the show. Can you do that? Yeah, I'll click for them. <laughs> as, soon as, I, as soon as I wake him up, I'll let him know. I'll see you later, sir. God bless you. Thanks to Colonel Retired, uh, Dr. Gordon Sumner from of veterans moving forward for being with us today. I'm Jack L. Tilly, 12th Sergeant Major of the Army, and you've been watching your next mission video podcast. And thank you for watching today. Please visit our website at yournextmission.org and, and leave me a review. I always say I hope it's a good review, but if it's a bad one, I guess I can take that too. You can also visit our nonprofit partners there who can provide you with so many services that will assist you in your transition from the military. Also, please visit our corporate partners and, and see all the jobs that are available. You know, we've, I think the other day we checked and, and we put to, to work, I, if I got the number correctly, somewhere around 6,000 people since we've been doing that. So we want to help. We want to assist you any way we can. I'm going to say that again. We want to assist you any way we can. So, uh, you know, just uh, let us know. Please follow me on all my personal social media pages, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. YouTube, LinkedIn, and Rumble. I love saying that. And if you've enjoyed this discussion with Colonel Retired Dr. Gordon, please like us. Click on that subscribe button below. And also click on the bell next to the subscribe button too. Don't forget, we want to hear from you. Please leave me a message or send me a text at 844-424-1134 or send me an email at smatilly at yournextmission.org. Thanks again to Colonel Sumner for for joining us today. It was just great having him on the show. And and at, again, at the end of the show, I always get to give my final, if you're, if you're a veteran and you're struggling and you need help, uh, reach out to, to Dr. Sumner uh, or Colonel Sumner. I, I don't think that you're by yourself. I told a story a minute ago about I had a friend that just went home after he got in the military and and just sit down on the couch. And, and you know, when you do that, what you're doing, you're trying to find a, a, a nice way to die. Uh, there's people that love you. There's people that want to take care of you. There are veterans that want to take care of you. So don't think you're by yourself. Uh, we all went to war. We've all struggled each and every day. It doesn't matter if you're a private or a general. We all struggled. But just just don't think that you're, you're there by yourself because we're here to do all we can to help you and your families. Again, thanks for watching. Thanks to New Mind Studios and, of course, our presenting sponsors, Navy Federal Credit Union, Purdue Global and USAA. We appreciate all you do for our military. And as always, I'll always say this one, 
We'll see you on the high ground. hoo You've been listening to Your Next Mission, brought to you by the American Freedom Foundation. Learn more by visiting yournextmission.org.